this falls under this here heading. Excuse me. Um, you have lots of just read this. Uh, you have lots of techniques on derivatives. You have power rule, chain rule, product rule. You, have, you can take a lot of derivatives. And of course, it, um, there's this tiny little three cases that you're missing. That's what this will satisfy. Three derivatives that you didn't know before, but you will after today. The first one is taking the derivative of an exponential function. Um, so for example, y equals two to the x. What's the derivative? So this is important because you know in compound interest for the for a one is exponential growth. And you would like to know how your bank account is growing. So uh, this is used in business cal quite a bit, this derivative. <coughs> um, so there are a couple ways to go at this. The only idea is I, I, we don't know the rule. We don't have it memorized. So we're going to have to do this kind of by just figuring it out on our own. What's one way to take the derivative? Give me one hypothesis. Or one thing I, you think I could, we could do. Change what? What did you say? What? Polly? Matt? Matt, what up? Give me something. Nothing? Nothing. Natural law. Why would natural law be awesome? Oh, that's perfect. Okay, that is actually what she just said is the key to doing any problem where there's an x in the exponent, whether it be this, that said 81, or this. All of these are the same strategy. You don't want x in the exponent, so you bring it down by taking the natural log. Well, it's not a natural log. By doing that, it allows you to bring the exponent down. That's called logarithmic differentiation. Now, you have two choices now. We want the derivative. So I could take the derivative now implicitly and solve. We know implicit differentiation. Why does it have to be solved for? So now if I take the derivative, the derivative of the left side with respect to x? 1 over, what's the derivative of log of y? 1 over y, and what's the derivative of the inside? 2 by the x, that's what we're looking for. What's the derivative of the right hand side? Is log of 2 a function or a constant? It's a constant, so it just comes out front, and what's the derivative of x? 1, all right? So dy dx is y log of 2. But if the original problem was an x term, then our final answer should be an x term. So we would replace, in other words, write yourself a note, put back an x term. What do we replace y with? 2 to the x. So we need to take the derivative of an exponential function. Pretty easy. It's just like the exponential function that was there times the factor of the log of the base itself. So for the derivative of a to the x, what is it, generally speaking? Instead of 2 to the x, it'll be a to the x. And instead of log of 2, it'll be log of a. Um, so, would you then consider the second idea? You did uh, log or a to the x is derivative. Now let's talk log base a to the x and its derivative. Um, this one, I think I'll throw you to the wolves and let you try this on your own. Give it a go. Talk it over with your math amigos, and we'll see if you guys can get it on your own.
you don't know the calculus, do some pre-calculus. What's some pre-calculus you can do? What can you do as a rewrite? And it's something you can do to rewrite. 2 to the y equals x. Love it. Okay? Should we take the derivative now, which we kind of do know how to do, or should we do a little more pre-calculus? Okay, what more pre-calculus do we do? Yeah, now you can take the natural log of both sides. We just said that if you don't like a variable in the exponent, take the log so you can bring it down. So y log of 2 equals log of x. All right. Now again, I could take the derivative now or move the log of 2. Take the derivative now or move the log of 2. Move the log of 2. Now, that actually, that right there, which you just did, is the change of base idea in pre-calc. I don't know if you remember that, but you did learn that. The change of base formula is if you have the log base 2 of x, it's the same as natural log of x over natural log of 2, or log of the argument over log of the base. That then said, now we're home free because we do know logs derivative, natural logs derivative. What is the derivative? First of all, the natural log of 2, constant or a variable expression? Constant. So what's the derivative of 1 over, or so 1 over log 2 stays. So what's the derivative of log of x? 1 over x. Now I typically write the x first, so it's not confusing as to if the x is in the log or not. If you write it as log of 2, then x, then people are not sure, is that x in the log or not? So typically when you have a log, you write it last, so there's no confusion. Uh, therefore, one or the derivative of log base a is 1 over x times the natural log of a. Right. Uh, the next question, uh, I think I'll put that on the homework, so we're going to come back to that. Uh, you'll see that that would be negative, but uh, that's a small point. Let's get to the next part, which will take a little longer. All right. So, so far you did, you've done the derivative of an exponential function without looking at your notes. What's the derivative of a to the x? a to the x natural log of a. What's the derivative of log base a of x? 1 over x natural log of a. All right. The third is absolute value. Absolute value derivatives take a little more work. It's not such a one little rule kind of case. There are two cases. Depends on where the absolute value is on how you approach this. But the big part by far is that when you have absolute value, it's all about piecewise. Okay? We know that absolute value affects negatives but not positives. And so you're going to get two different branches one for the positive that didn't get affected, and one for the negative that did. So if you then rewrite the function from absolute value as piecewise, then you can take the derivative on the pieces. So let me show you what I mean here. Um, let's go here. When you take the graph of absolute value of f of x, what happens to the graph? The parts, what happens to the pieces of the graph that are already above the y-axis? Nothing, because the absolute value of positive y is positive y. No effect. But what about the absolute value effect on parts below the axis? They get flipped up and made positive, right? So for positive f of x, is there is no change. Absolute value of x is exactly the same as the function itself. But for negative f of x, is they get uh, made positive, or you get the opposite sign. So for these, the absolute value of f of x is the opposite of the negative y values you would expect to get. In those cases, f is negative, so we're switching the signs to make them positive. That's what absolute value does to negative, right? So let me give you an example. If I gave you the function absolute value of x squared minus 4 and said, what's the derivative? Uh, there's a little bit more work than a normal derivative where you just answer. You have to do a little background work. 
Um, if not on paper, then at least mentally picture stress. What is the absolute value of x squared minus 4 stress? What's it, what's it without the absolute value? Mr. Palmer, what's the graph like without the absolute value? Yeah, Perfect. Okay. So normally the graph would want to look like this, but the absolute value then takes the negative parts, which this is supposed to be symmetric, and flips them up. Yeah? Now, as far as writing this piecewise here, let's change this and rewrite it in a piecewise way. There really are three regions. The part less than negative 2, the part between negative 2 and 2, and the part after 2. What about the part at the far left? Did the y values get changed, or are they the same? The same. So in that region, that is the same as it was, no effect. But what about from negative 2 to 2? All those y values that wanted to be negative got flipped. So what is the, really is the function in this region? It's not x squared minus 4. It's the absolute value of that. And the absolute value would cause every side to be opposite. So instead of x squared minus 4, it would be the opposite. Negative x squared plus 4. Let's check that. At x equals 0, what do you get? Four. Does that make sense? Right. And then, what about the far right side? Did that get changed? Okay, so it's normal x squared minus four. Right. Now, as far as the inequalities, it is continuous. So uh, x should be defined. X is defined at negative 2 and 2, I put them in the middle branch, but you could just as well put them on the outside branches as long as it's one or the other. It, it shouldn't be both because there shouldn't be any too little confusion, but it should be there somewhere. You with me? All right, then. Now, once you've written it as a piecewise, you then take the derivative of the pieces. What's the derivative of the leftmost piece? 2x. What's the derivative of the inner piece? Negative 2x. And the far right piece? 2x. Now there's one little gotcha in here. The first is still for less than negative 2. The second is between negative 2 and 2. And the far right is still greater than 2. But what, what little gotcha in there, you reckon? Can you see it? What happened at that negative 2 and 2 when you flipped it? derivative was. There's a sharp turn there, all right? There's a sharp turn there, so does the derivative exist there? No. So you would not, this is not less than or equal to now because the derivative does not exist at these sharp turns. Okay. So although it's almost identical to taking the pieces straight across derivatives, uh, there is that inequality switch. All right, uh, let's go to this bad boy. Okay, this one. Uh, what does the x cubed shape look like? Show me. Okay, and what does it want to do? Right one, up one, left one, down one. Right one. Okay, so it's right one. It would normally be like this. But the absolute value causes it to do this. Okay? It's actually a worse parabola, but it should be narrower than a normal parabola. The pieces need to pass the ordinary parabolas, yeah? I didn't draft that very well. So to, de to the derivative of a piecewise, which is the question, you first write f 
has a piece right. Now this one doesn't have two branches, it only uh, three branches, it only has two. The left branch, which is let x less than or equal to one. Is it normal f or opposite f? Opposite f. It's all the y values or the f values got switched. And what about the right side of one? Normal f or opposite f? Normal. Normal f. I have the less than or equal to on the left hand side, but you could put it on the right, that doesn't matter. Now we're ready to take the derivative. F prime. What's the derivative of the left hand branch? Negative 3, x minus 1 to the second, any chain rule, part derivative to the middle? No. All right, what about the right side derivative? Same thing but positive, yeah? Okay, what about the domain of the first? x is less than 1, not equal to, because there's a sharp turn. Is there a sharp turn? No, it's actually smooth there. If I were to zoom in on Q, it's, it's flat there. And so it's actually, I know I just said there can be a sharp turn. In most cases, there really is a sharp turn. But this is one case where there isn't. So the derivative does exist there because it's not a sharp turn. And what's the same limit? The limit of the slopes would be zero or zero on both sides, so it would match and so the derivative does exist. Cool? Um, this, uh, in the interest of, how much, how much homework questions do we have? A lot or not? All right, um, I'll put one of these on the homework. This one, just to give you a kind of preview, this would be rougher because this would be a sinusoid that did this, so you'd have to find the zeros of the sinusoid to see where it got flipped. And you'd be talking a little messier there. All right. Um, we'll come back to that or put one on the homework. Let's go to the absolute value inside. This is simple. You don't have that? I jumped it. value on x be? Yeah, it changes. It makes positive x's and negative x's behave differently. So it's more of a right side, left side of the graph rather than top half, bottom half of the graph. Um, maybe I'll put that in later as well. Um, we'll, come, we'll come back. I don't want to let that go, but I guess we'll go to questions on. Maybe we do Yeah, let's go. Questions on 71. Two? Eighteen. Eighteen. One. Six. Eleven. Fifteen. Seventeen. Sixteen. Fifteen. Twenty-one. What else? Sixteen. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so yeah, this is what I'm digging. Y equals R cosecant of X. So you're doing the derivative, yay? Oh, X over 4. Okay, can you get me started? What's the first thing I do? Why? Yes, you rearrange this so it's an implicit equation. This is the same as cosecant y equals x over 4. All right? We do this process, so then you only have to remember the process, not six different derivative rules. 
right, arc going arc full circuit. That's just less memorization if we do this problem. All right. What's the anti or what's the derivative of cosecant? Do you remember that? Negative cotangent cosecant or cosecant cotangent. Okay. But by chain rule or implicit derivative, it's then time. Y dx. The derivative of the right hand side is one fourth. Okay. All right. Dy dx. When I divide those over, I could either call them cosecant cotangent in the denominator or sine tangent in the numerator. What do you want to do? Okay, negative sine y tangent y in the numerator. The four is still there. The negative tangent. All right. <clears throat> now, here's where we need to sub back for those trig expressions with some x equivalent. This is how we do that. If you draw a triangle based on that trig equation, <clears throat> y is the angle, and x over sides imply. Well, if cosecant is 1 over sine, then instead of opposite hypotenuse, it's hypotenuse to opposites. Opposite, or hypotenuse is x, and hypotenuse is, or sorry, hypotenuse is x, opposite is 4. By Pythagorean theorem, the adjacent side then is x squared minus 16 square root. We? Okay. Now, um, the sine of y. What's the sine of y? 4 over x. And what's tangent of y? Four root over root x squared minus 16. One of those fours drops out, I guess. So we get something like negative 4 over x root x squared minus 16. Make sense? Okay. One, or is one still a question? All right. Uh, yeah, this is kind of weird. This is a one-shot problem. You only see it once. Uh, So if you guys go to be civil or structural engineers, I guess this might be something you would do. Uh, so the radius is 6. This is D and this is W. They say the strength of the beam S varies jointly, which is a linear relation or a constant times two variables or more. And it feels like W matters a little less than D, strength of the beam, if you put a weight on it. The thickness would mean more than the weight. I guess that makes sense in my mind. All right, well, anyway. Uh, find a value of W that maximizes the strength of the beam. So we're going to maximize S, yeah? Yeah? <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, K is a constant, so don't sweat that as far as substituting in for that. It's fine the way it is. But uh, we would like to get W and D squared down to uh, one variable, yeah? So, what's another WD relationship besides the strength? What? The area? I don't know the area, but you're right to think geometrically. What about this? This is 12, yeah? And so by Pythagorean theorem, uh, there's a WD relationship. W squared plus D squared equals 12 squared. Um, so... Find the value of W. So wouldn't you say that D squared is 144 minus W squared? Now I would, I guess I could square root that, but subbing in for the whole D squared is great. Let's sub in for the whole thing. So S is K W, 144 minus W squared. Uh, multiply it out and take the derivative or just product will derivative. Multiply it out, okay. 
So S equals 144 KW minus KWQ. Sounds good. What is S prime or DSDW? Well, remember K is a constant. 144K minus 3KW squared. It is zero or undefined, but there's no undefined space here. Uh, w is 144 over 3, the k's drop out, square rooted. That's uh, 144 over 3. 48, the square rooted is square root of 48, roughly 7. A little less than 7 or 4 root 3, yeah? Okay, so w needs to be a little less than 7. Um, and I think that's the answer. If I did a test on this, you would see that it is going to go from uh, positive to negative. When this is small, this would be positive. So that feels like a mess. Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, number six. Question on six. All right. So you've got this curve, e to the negative x squared, which never equals zero because e to a power is always something. You can draw many rectangles in here, short and wide, or tall and skinny, or somewhere in between. These rectangles then vary in area. What's the greatest possible area is the question that they eventually get to. A, what's the area in of the rectangle in terms of x? So what's the area, would you, how'd you tackle A? 2x, okay, so that's the main, uh, usually that's a mistake people make, but uh, Colin did not make that. The base is not x, it's 2x is y, and the height is y. What can you put in for y? the negative x squared, all right? Um, now, that's minus the area. So to get the greatest possible area, we want to find where a prime goes positive to negative. Mm -hmm. What kind of derivative rule will you have to use for the derivative on that? Chain rule and product rule. So a prime is first is the same. What is the derivative of e to the negative x squared? e to the negative x squared times negative 2x plus second stays the same. Derivative of the first with derivative of 2x or 2f2. Um, probably the easiest to solve this for critical numbers is by factor out of 2 and an e to the negative x squared. So if I take out a 2 and e to the negative x squared, in here, I'm still left with negative 2x squared. And in here, all I have is a 1. Okay? Um, can 2e to the negative x squared equal 0? No. What about negative 2x squared plus 1? What x or x is actually, let's just go positive x. What x makes that true? Two, 2 over 2, I agree. Square root of 1 half, which does simplify to root 2 over 2. Um, that is a positive to negative case. Um, when x is small, this would be positive. This is always positive. And when x is large, this would be negative. So it, that is a max. Um, I don't require an optimization problem that you show the sign test. That's just good math to think in. Make sure that's all right. It is. Is it cool? Uh, I don't know if I answered the question. It says find the exact area. So did I answer the question yet? I did not. So the area is 2x e to the negative x squared. That's 2 root 1 half times e to the negative 1 half, I guess. Huh? Cool? Oh, great. Uh, what number is that? 6? 11. Or is that 11? 6. 11. Does anybody need 11 still? Okay. 11. Oh, man, these are my 
I had this as a warm up yesterday, but I, with the volume lesson, I didn't think it, I would have time to do how oh, so. This one's a hard one. And you are wise to ask. Okay. Uh, first thing I think of when I see that is you, so, because you know, maybe, but I think you'll agree that if you make u 25 minus 9x to the fourth, the u is not x to the first power. It's x cubed power. So that was a good hypothesis, but it doesn't turn out. Um, what is this like? Yeah, it's arc sine with a u sub, right? So I would have in my mind, can I make it like this? Good morning, Devlin Jaguar. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Take out the three. Then I'm going to focus on making the one. Musical costume crew. We will meet today at 245 in the drummer. You want this to be one. So I'm going to factor out a 25. And when I do, it changes both of those. So that amounts to a three fifths. Right. Now, I'm ready to start my use of process. If I want this to work, then it looks like 9 25ths x to the 4 equals u to the 2nd, which means u is 3 fifths x squared. Now if I do that substitution, the bottom becomes 1 minus u squared, and I'll be good. But now I still have that dx problem to worry about. So if I take the square root of the derivative of this, I get 6 fifths x dx equals u, or equals du. You follow? Now I have the x dx, but I don't have that 6 fifths, so x dx then should be replaced with a 5 6 du. Then that 5 6 can be moved out front. And the derivative is just our sign. And you replace sign back, or you back. That's tough. You and Jim. Shaded region. First of all, there's symmetry. So let's start there. Um, I can double or whatever happens. Second, if I want the shaded region, then I actually just like taking the whole left hand line and subtracting away the piece below it to get the upper piece back. So think upper minus lower. Upper is this line, which is Lower is different points on the curve. So the lower is the curve, 4 over 1 plus x squared. 
That's all I do now, sir. Have a great day. Um, and from negative, uh, from zero to one. Can I see the doubt, can you just send it? Can you just go negative one to one and not go to the system? It works fine. Um, now, does that, did you go or should we still talk about the antiderivative? Uh, okay. You good? Okay. You still, oh, okay. All right. Um, 17, check. 15. Anybody in 15? Yeah. Okay. Grab for the unit circle. This. Oh, shucks. Okay. All right. So I put these up, 15, 21, and 16. Right. Have a nice day. How are you?